Good evening. Hello, I'm Jay Ellis, Associate Teaching Professor in the Program for Writing and Rhetoric here at the University of Colorado. For those watching our streaming tonight, yeah, we sometimes call it CU, not using. And I advise the all student staff for Hindsight Creative Nonfiction. We're here to launch the second volume of our annual Hindsight Presents title on the climate crisis, Changing Skies. This new journal began and continues with funding from Scott King's Mission Zero initiative, and now also from CU's Undergraduate Research Opportunity Fund, for which we especially want to thank UROP's director, Tim O'Neill. And with the ongoing support of Hindsight's many publishing projects by the Program for Writing and Rhetoric. None of tonight's events could have come together without the amazing student staff you'll see on this journal's masthead, as well as the extra help of Mindy Slaughter and Linda Nasita in the PWR front office, and of course, the excellent work of our contributing writers and artists. This new issue of Changing Skies truly includes worldwide skies, as you'll see from the global range of our contributing writers. But yes, we definitely still feature some writing and much art from CU students in this new print issue. Tonight, you'll hear writers from all over, some in person and some international contributors by video, introduced by a few of our fantastic 25 student staffers. And now our editor-in-chief, Ian Hall, who designed this gorgeous cover and the new layout for our pages, will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Jay. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, braving the slick pavement to join us tonight. My name is Ian Hall. I am the editor-in-chief of Hindsight and Changing Skies. This is my fourth semester on the journal and my fourth print issue. Uh, with every new print cycle, our staff faces new and exciting challenges. Uh, for myself, my first semester was on 2021's Hindsight Volume 2, where our staff was getting back in the saddle of in-person production meetings after a couple years of Zoom rooms, email chains, and different time zones. Uh, following that big global thing that happened in 2020. The next semester was Changing Skies Volume 1, which was uh, an introduction of a whole new print title into our workflow. It, it forced us to recreate the entire staff uh, organization top to bottom, effectively doubled our yearly workload, so quite a bit of a learning curve for us there. Uh, the next semester after that, Hindsight Volume 3, we were dipping our toes into uh, international submissions following a very successful visit to Seattle's uh, Association for Writers and Writing Programs Conference, or AWP, if you don't have the kind of time that I do. The next semester after that, of course, being Changing Skies Volume 2, uh, the book you're now holding in your hands. We went full throttle into our international submissions with this one, um, really opening up the floodgates and uh, really opening up the diversity of stuff that we could publish and the stuff that we could print uh, in the journal that you now hold. Of course, this year was a big one for us in a lot of other ways, not just Changing Skies Volume 2, but our international submissions allowed us to join CLMP, the Community for Literary Magazines and Presses, a really cool community that helps us continue and expand on our mission to bring incredible creative nonfiction to our pages. It's also the 10-year anniversary of uh, Journal 2020's very first print issue. Way back in 2013, that started out of a single classroom with purely student work, and over the years has only evolved into what we have today. And even though we are now accepting lots of writing from all over, including many of which we're showcasing here tonight with our readings, uh, we, we do, do not forget our core identity as, as a student-led, student, -led, student uh, writing journal. You know, we're, we're very much uh, allowing that to drive us into the future and, and has driven us this far. And even though we're a little bit bigger now and we're a little bit broader and have bigger shoes to fill, uh, we still know that those students and stories shape us and continue to do so. To speak a little bit more about those students and their stories, uh, we have Mr. Scott King with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Scott King is working with the Mission Zero Fund to provide resources to CU students working on various climate change projects everywhere from writing to wind turbines. Thanks to Mr. Scott's uh, help and, and his uh, support through Mission Zero, uh, Changing Skies was able to get off the ground last year, and uh, his support continues to impact the pages that we hold in our hands tonight. Uh, for more information about Mission Zero, uh, including spaces to donate if you wish, uh, go ahead and, and check out the QR codes in the first few pages of your books. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight again, and enough of me blabbering. Please join us in welcoming our keynote speaker of the evening, Mr. Scott King. Uh, 
Um, my name's Scott King, and I'm the founder of Mission Zero, and I'm excited to be here tonight um, to welcome you on this journey. This is me in 1985, by the way. <laughs> so, yes, I was this young, wild-eyed electrical engineering student graduating, not sure what I was going to do with my life. Um, and, you know, since then, uh, my brother and I started a company called ReadyTalk. Uh, we did that for about 17 years and built a great company, a company that um, a lot of people wanted to work for, was recognized as one of the best companies to work for, one of the fastest growing companies. Um, and in 2017, we sold it to PGI, and Dan and I um, retired. And what do you do when you retire? You, you get a house in the mountains. You go vacation with your family. You golf with your buddies. That's what you do. And then what happened? So I got to a point. I, I think everybody has a, a point in their life where um, you try to make sense of the world and, and you, you fall short. And, and, and you're not sure where things are going to go. You're, you're at a crossroads. And I got to a pretty um, dark place in about... Well, it was during the pandemic. Um, and to me, seeing what was going on with how we were handling the pandemic, how we were handling climate change, and what was happening to democracy put me into a pretty dark place. And so I sat down with my wife and my kids, and I said, what can I do? And, and they gave me financial support, and they gave me advice and said, go, go do something positive. And so I started Mission Zero. I started it partly because as I started to look at climate change, it became obvious to me that this is an existential threat. Um, Barack Obama said it as clearly as I think anybody can say it, is that we're the first generation that is feeling the effects of climate change and the last generation that can do anything about it. And I tell students this, and, and students get it. They understand what's going on. And, and sometimes they feel helpless. Sometimes they feel like, this system isn't fair, and I'm a cog, and I can't do much about it. And, and there is a real anxiety that comes with climate, with the uncertainty of what that future looks like. This is a picture of Greece. So this is uh, the valley that they grow most of their food. Um, in September of last year, of this year, um, they had almost a meter of water in, in uh, between three and four days. A, me a meter of water fall down on Greece. It is going to take them over a decade to recover from that. That's not normal. That's not normal. This is a picture of Shanghai. This is a picture of Libya. Between five and 10,000 people died because of these floods. Canada. The fires this year in Canada were off the charts. Uh, you looked at the smoke that happened in New York. It was. Uh, uh, un un unbreathable. This is the 30th, 30 warmest northern summers that we've had, and you can see this year is completely off the chart. This happened a month ago that hit my radar. Um, the, the West Antarctic ice sheet is now officially gone. It is, there's nothing we can do, but that, that is going to slide into the ocean, and it's going to create between two and five meters of sea level rise. That's baked in. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, it's, it's, it's hard not to look at this and say, you know, what do you do in the face of such calamity, in the face of such big systems that you can't control? And, and one of the things I, I talk to students about is what's happening? What's happening in our climate? And this chart on the, on the right is uh, over 800,000 years, and it shows the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And sometimes people say, well, is it really man-made? Do you see the part that kind of strikes up? What, what happened to cause that? What, what happened to cause the CO2 to go from 300 to 420? Any ideas? Somebody's got this one. Come on. Industrial. Industrial, yeah, steam engine. That's right. Um, so I'm an electrical engineering student, um, graduate, and so I know a little bit about energy. And 
it was interesting because what humanity figured out is that, you know, pack mules and horses and, and people, you know, that can move things around, but boy, engines can do it a lot faster and a lot easier. And so we started burning things to work, to do work for us. And we became amazingly successful at it. Um, and, and, and to be honest, you know, we have very rich lives because of the innovations that we have done through technologies like that. Um, but we can't sustain it. This, this chart is actually measured CO2 in the atmosphere, and we can actually tell where it's coming from. Um, does that look like it's going down? No, we're not there yet. We, and, and what happens if it keeps going that way? Extinction. We go through the sixth mass extinction on this planet, and we created it. And so um, I, I was talking to my wife, Tracy, which I want to say thank you for all the support that you have given me on this. So. I didn't mean this to be a little bit too doomy-ish at the beginning, but the, the interesting part about this is that we know where this is. We know what, what's causing this, and we know what the solutions are. This is the emissions from burning fossil fuel, which is 70% of our carbon emissions. So 70% of climate change, three quarters of climate change is because we're using fossil fuel energy for doing work. Okay. Cool, all right, so we need to stop that. And we need to stop it as quickly as we can. That seems pretty obvious. We need to transition from burning things to clean, renewable energy to do things, right? It, it seems easy, but it, it, it isn't. And uh, so how many of you use AI? And if you don't raise your hand, you're an idiot. If you do raise your hand and use AI as your work, you're an idiot. But AI is an amazing tool. AI is going to change the world, hopefully in a positive way. Hopefully in a positive way. I built an AI GPT. I built a personal assistant to help me understand what my carbon impact is, what my carbon footprint is. And, I, and it, you can engage with AI and learn. It's an amazing learning platform. And this is what it told me. It said, prior to us working on reducing it, Tracy and I had a carbon footprint of about 35 metric tons per year. So 35 tons per year based on mostly energy. Um, and so, you, so it basically said, well, you know, if without solar, you're about seven metric tons in electricity usage. You're 10 metric tons in, in how you drive around. And you're heating your home with gas, and that's five metric tons. And all these things add up. And the, the average US carbon footprint is 16 metric tons. So the two of us are a little above average, but not horribly. But the worldwide average is about four. And we got to get to zero. And so I went on a mission, a mission zero. I went on a mission to try to figure out how do I build a, a, a house and the way we live that is more sustainable. And, um, and so this is, this is my home, our Tracy and my home, and, and we've installed solar. That took out seven. We drive electric cars. That took out nine. We're installing a microgrid with batteries that'll enhance the grid's performance to put out more renewable energy, and we're putting in heat pumps for both hot water and, uh, and air. And that'll save about 21.7 metric tons. And, and, and everybody has a journey like this. Our next thing is how else can we reduce our carbon impact? You know, traveling, air travel is huge. How many of you know what a heat pump is? Oh, yes. That is excellent. <laughs> I've, I asked that to um, business students that I, I lecture to, and um, the, the percentage is not good. And, and the reason I mention that is because without understanding the solutions to climate change, how are we gonna solve this problem? And one of the things that Mission Zero is trying to do is help educate students and engage students on climate in every discipline, not just engineering, not just environmental studies, but everyone. And so, um, so I talked to students about heat pumps, hot water heat pumps, and induction stoves, because 
If we're going to move from burning fossil fuel to clean energy, we need to understand how to electrify everything. How do we do the things that we want to do, but do it sustainably? This is, so um, <laughs> you probably noticed I'm wearing something. <laughs> so um, CU is, is uh, an amazing university. So I'm, I, and I tell students this, I'm, I am, I bleed black and gold. You know, Tracy, and I met my wife here. Um, all three of our kids went here. My brothers and sisters went here. My mom went here. I am, I've been to every football game, every basketball game. I'm here on campus half my life, it feels like. But what hurts me is how the university is dealing with the climate crisis on an operational basis. And so they're building two new dorms, um, brand new dorms, and they haven't done this in a while, and they need them. But they've decided to, to build these dorms with gas heating. And, and to me, so by the way, if you were building in the city of Boulder, you couldn't get a permit for building a, a building with gas hookup. You couldn't do that today. And so, you know, I, I, I just struggle with the, the decisions this university is making as it relates to, to the, the climate uh, problem. And, you know, so th the thing that I struggle with is that we, we, the, the university hosted a uh, Right Here, Right Now conference. I don't know if you guys went to that. It really was talking about one of the big issues of climate change is climate justice and the, the need for a, a just energy transition. And what that talks about is that, you know, the northern countries have caused most of the climate damage, and the southern countries are the ones that have the least amount of resources to deal with it. And, and, the, and the injustice of that, and how do you deal with basically wiping out an entire population because we've decided that we want to burn fossil fuel forever. Um, so for me, the hypocrisy of saying one thing and doing another is, is tough. Um, and so as a, as a result of that decision, they're investing 43, this just came out on the 7th of this month. They announced that they're investing about $43 million in new boilers to keep our power plant big enough to support these new dorms and reduce the emissions that the power plant is. Because I don't know if you've seen Colorado's air, but it's awful. And it's, 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 and, and, and the, the city and the, the, the state is demanding that um, universities and companies start to clean up their, their emissions. And so they're doing that. But instead of putting in new boilers, we should be putting in heat pumps. We should be designing this and being a showcase and not, a, not a, a follower, but a leader in climate. And so one of the things that's an ask is if you're interested in standing up or voicing your opinion on this, we've got a club called the Fossil Free CU Club. It's asking for both divestment as well as um, support for reducing the influence of fossil fuel on this campus. Sometimes I feel like CU is an oil and gas college. It, it feels that way sometimes. And, and I think for us to have pride in the university that we, we work in or we graduate from, we need to change that. So um, I'm, a, I'm available. Um, I have office hours every Tuesday and Thursday um, to talk about climate, talk about projects, um, talk about issues on, on social justice. Um, and what, what you've done in the Changing Skies Journal is nothing but amazing. You think about how do you influence people, and it's through stories. It's through writing. It's through art. That's how you connect. It's, it's an amazing way to, to, to talk about a complex issue in a way that can actually connect to people. And, and we live in a very, um, I, our political environment is, is, is difficult. And so if there's a way that we can communicate that can cross those boundaries and can bring people together and understand that this is a common problem we all have and we all need to work together on it. And I think that is, I think the, the, the work you're doing with Changing Skies is absolutely amazing. And I, I just want to, one, recognize Jay and the entire staff for this kind of amazing publication. 
And I hope it inspires other universities to think about how they can expand their writing programs to include climate-focused journalism. So with that, I thank you, and I am so thrilled to be part of this. So thank you again. Thank you, Scott. Hello, I'm Marissa Lang, the Assistant Editor-in-Chief for Hindsight and Changing Skies, with this being my fourth semester on staff. I would like to introduce the author of our foreword, Erin Espelli. In addition to being an Associate Professor and a co-founder and co-director of the Nature, Environment, Science, and Technology Studio for the Arts here at CU Boulder, she's a writer, editor, and filmmaker. Her poetic nonfiction films have been shown across the world, including at events such as the New York Film Festival, the British Film Institute London Film Festival, the Whitechapel Gallery, and more. Please flip to page 11 as Erin Espelli reads the foreword. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, congratulations to the incredible editorial staff. Uh, I want to just mention that when I got the email from the editor-in-chief, Ian, I had quite a bit going on, and there wasn't a huge amount of time in which to write. And yet it was his persuasive email and the um, objective of the magazine that drew me to agree to, to write this. I think all that you authors, poets, um, artists of all stripes are doing for this is, is really incredible. So I'm so um, pleased and honored to have been part of it. Um, <clears throat> 13 ways of looking at the sky, an introduction. One, above 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the body of the cloud. Two, our readings of the sky can be interpreted in Rorschach fashion to gauge our mood, steel gray, lace-like, sunny, ink, inky black, bathed in alpine glow, red at night, a sailor's delight, or tinged with enough blue to patch a Dutchman's trousers. Three, Looking down at Earth from the moon, we can see straight through to the oceans, but looking up in daylight, the sun obscures the cosmos. The atmosphere acts as a one-way scrim. Light scatters and stars only appear as pinpricks of light to the naked eye at night. We project ourselves up there into a singularly shared space to see a small part of the pantomime. Four. In 2004, filmmaker James Benning pointed his camera up he made a 100-minute film, 10 Skies, in which he filmed 10 distinct skies for 10 minutes each. Viewers can choose to see stasis in the lack of camera movement or aberrations in the skyscapes, from crossing aircraft to drifting wildfire smoke. Five, I do not know which to prefer, the sublimity of sky that hides the destructive human hand, or the one that reveals the daylight scrim to be stained by smog and smoke, scratched by satellites, the nighttime skies bleached by artificial light. Six, stable ice in Patagonia. I prefer that, as Whitney Brown describes in the pages that follow in her dreamscape, Perito Moreno, how to travel with the mind to the Andes Mountains. Sky puncturing mountains, turquoise hued lakes, and a notch of earth called the Peninsula de Megalanes protect one of the last stable glaciers on the planet, one that might even speak to us if we have faith enough to write, to listen, and interpret. Because we know that humans cannot nor should not provide all that we know. Seven. James Benning made another film in 2004 called 13 Lakes, in which he filmed 13 lakes, each shot lasting again 10 minutes without moving. The film, therefore, is 130 minutes, each frame split half sky and half water. Benning explains that his formal choices relate to how the 2004 films are, quote, the antithesis of war. 
because atmospheric portraits are precisely about the kind of beauty we're destroying. Eight, destruction comes in so many forms. On these pages, Samuel Myers Verge writes in Obsolescence of an Oasis of the impact of drought on families, whole communities in Eastern Morocco. People must uproot, become semi-nomadic without knowing where they might land. Myers Verge describes one such haunting, quote, the father's mile long stare, not directed anywhere, aimlessly wandering as a ghost. Nine. Flight and escape takes another shape in the poem Six More Weeks of Winter. James Mead calls upon our myths to remind us how reliant we and so many other species, like the scrupulous migrating birds, are to the circular cycles of seasons, and what we lose when disruption comes, when those in power get greedy and the powers that be get more powerful. 10. In the essay, Marine Murderer, Nancy Whitecross remembers the most magical dive of her life, underwater, off the coast of South Africa, in the waters of Aliwal Shoal, searching for beauty and biological symbiosis among scores of dolphins, anemone tentacles, wrasse that, quote, do a small dance, groupers, and more. Ecosystems like this one may be relegated only to memories or memories of images, what sharp cry can we utter? 11. Wallace Stevens wrote in 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird in section 11 that, quote, once a fear pierced him when he mistook the shadow of his carriage for blackbirds. 12. The climate is changing. Creatures must be flying. 13. As you experience the words and images ahead, I ask you to consider what have we mistook as shadow? How much more beauty might we discover if we make room for speculation as Whitney Brown does? What formal structures might we create to understand change, both subtle and extreme? What kind of sky do we want to see betwixt the cedar limbs or across flat desert? Clock your minutes, mark your mood, and gauge how you want to see your future up there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor S. Pally. We, are, we at Hindsight are extremely proud to be able to provide a platform for writers and artists to share their experiences and creativity to the rest of the world. In my two years of being on staff, our journal has grown an astonishing amount from only publishing CU students to publishing internationally with writers and artists from places such as Australia, China, Jordan, and Nigeria. In the past year, we have participated and joined widely recognized organizations such as the Associate, or Association of Writers and Writing Program Conference in Seattle and the Community of Literary Magazines and Presses. I hope you all continue to take part in our wild journey as we expand our presence. Hindsight and changing skies wouldn't be possible without people like you. If you would like to have a chance to be published in an upcoming volume of one of our printed journals or online, you can submit through our free submittable, which can be found on our website, hindsightjournal.org. We receive submissions on a rolling basis, so you are welcome to submit to us any point in the year. Every submission goes through the blind review process, so there's never any bias in our selection process. Now, I would like to introduce our next reader. Please flip to page 63 to follow along as Whitney Brown, a climate change writer who has been published in a state journal, reads an excerpt from her piece, Perito Moreno. Hi, I'm Whitney Brown, and this is the beginning of my essay, Perito Moreno, published in Changing Skies, Volume 2. I like to daydream about magnificent places, and one of the planet's most incredible sights is in the southern Patagonia ice field among sky-puncturing mountains, turquoise-hued lakes, and wind-shaped clouds. This site, the Perino Moreno Glacier, is something to behold. 98 square miles of snow and ice, ridges and crevasses, marvel and wonder. So, as Perino Moreno transforms Andean snow into ice, we'll marvel. And as the glacier curves 19 blue miles toward a lake, as it towers hundreds of feet above the water, we'll wonder. Finally, when the ice cliffs calve under the weight of upslope snow, 
Well, behold, a cathedral's worth of glacier tumbling into the lake. I've never set foot in Patagonia. Even so, my daydream passport bears shivering stamps of Argentina, slick as ice stickers of Perino Moreno. In tangible Patagonia, most people look at Perino Moreno from viewing platforms. But in my wildest imaginings, I can go wherever I like, do whatever I want. Scale the ice cliffs, cartwheel between the ridges, camp at the bottom of the crevasses. More than anything, I like to pretend that I'm swimming in the lake. From the surface, Perito Moreno would look as jagged as a geode, and huge crystals would conceal the ice cliff tops. I'd lounge on the lake, the water somehow bath warm, but the glacier would calve, ice splintering from the cliffs, and in the second before the shards hit the water, I'd try to dash away. As the frozen mass struck the surface, I'd sink through the lake, where ice chunks would look like teal silhouettes. Then one silhouette would rise beneath me, and I'd look down to see a piece of ice surging to the surface. Lifted by that ice, supported by it, I'd burst back into the air. Flecks of mist would fall like rain, but once they had subsided, I'd see the ice cliff's new facades. Azure, angled, sharp. I'd wonder if the people on the viewing platform could see me, or if I melted into the J-blue water. Glaciers shrink when they melt in calve faster than they receive new snowfall, and in the era of climate change, most of Earth's glaciers are shrinking. But Perito Moreno is stable, Andean snowstorms making up for its calved ice. For a dreamer like me, one whose nightmares are often linked to climate change, Perito Moreno's stability is a delight. It's a source of awe, wonder, gratitude. I ask myself, should I make a pilgrimage to Patagonia? What would it be like to see Perito Moreno, to wave hello to a glacier, to surround myself with ice? I think I would cry. I know I would cry. But my pilgrimage would spew carbon into the atmosphere, an air-altering action that, on a planet hurt by many air-altering actions, threatens glacial stability. I'm not one to travel lightly, but I do travel often. And if Perito Moreno ever tipped toward catastrophe, I suspect I would fall apart, crumble. So I haven't planned a pilgrimage, not yet. Instead, I picture myself swimming and soaring at the glacier, shining. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Angelina and I currently volunteer for Einside Journal. Um, volunteering at the journal has been an incredibly wonderful experience. I've had the opportunity to work with talented, kind peers and be a part of an incredibly important publication. I have the honor to introduce you to Nancy Whitecross, the first place winner of our Changing Skies Climate Change Journal. Um, Nancy is originally from England and she currently resides in South Africa. As a dive instructor who has the opportunity to travel around the world, she has first experienced how climate change has impacted our Earth's oceans. Here is Nancy reading a selection from her piece, Marine Murderer. Please refer to page 28 to follow along. Good evening all, my name is Nancy Whitecross. I come to you this evening from a very hot and humid Johannesburg in South Africa. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the staff and editors at Hindsight. When I entered this competition a couple of months ago, I never dreamt that my story would be published, let alone be chosen as this year's winner. I'm truly grateful and honored to be with you tonight, and I'd like to read a short excerpt from my story, Marine Murderer. The ocean was calm that day. There was no wind, only the sun beating down on my head as the dive boat sped on top of the water. The sky reflected an azure blue with not a cloud in the sky. My fingertips gently touched the water, People asked me what I was doing when they heard me calling my friends to come and play with us. Within minutes, they had surrounded the boat, jumping gracefully in and out of the water. The bottlenose dolphins knew I was there. They waited for me to join them. Just six kilometers off the coast of Umkamas, south of Durban in the province of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa is Alawashol, one of the top 10 dive sites in the world. John, a fellow instructor and friend, brought a student on his first dive. 
The conversation was exciting as the student, his father, anticipated an incredible dive while we tried to play it down, as Ella will show could be daunting. More often than not, the visibility is less than five meters. When we dive in this glorious place, we must remind ourselves that we are invaders of the fish species habitat. It is not an aquarium. I had my camera on the boat that day, hoping to capture my friends playing underwater. We kitted up. When I was ready, I did a back roll into the water with the dive boy. Immediately, the dolphins surrounded me as I dived to the bottom of North Sands, 10 meters underwater. John and his father followed me. Once our student was safe, I handed the boy line to John and immediately pointed my camera at the dolphins, scratching their backs in the sand, one after the other, as though they were dancing to music. An albino dolphin joined in the fun. John and I tried to count how many of them were playing. It must have been close to 100. Our student was mesmerized as he knelt in the sand watching them. As they ascended to breathe, two giant manta rays appeared out of nowhere, one covering my whole body as I lay horizontally above the sand. They disappeared into the depths of the deep blue ocean. Adrenaline rushed through my body. I had experienced true love and joy from the living creatures below. That's all. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye and have a wonderful evening. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Calvert. I'm the online managing editor at Hindsight. Hello, I'm Estrella Vigil and I'm the assistant managing editor for Hindsight and Changing Skies. One of our recent goals at the journal is to reach beyond Boulder and extend to a global base of readers and contributors. To that end, we sought to improve and develop our website. Hence why my position exists. <laughs> Thank you. This semester, Estrella, Paimon, Gyasi, a few others, and I took an ax to our website and completely rebuilt it, including getting a whole new domain, HeinsteinJournal.org. With this website redesign, we've added tons of new content while featuring our past content. We published new online exclusive pieces such as Shopping List by jo Jordan Egelman, as well as past pieces such as Remembering What I Fight For by Palma Siegel from Changing Skies Volume 1. Additionally, as, as a sneak peek into Changing Skies Volume 2, we've published the Changing Skies contest winning pieces, Marine Murderer by Nancy Whitecross, who we just heard from, and The Promise of Granite by Mara Buck, who we will hear from next. Our website also features full PDFs of all volumes and journals. Of journals. <laughs> While our website has come so far this semester, we plan to go even further. We have plans for a writing contest for online exclusive pieces. Please keep an eye on our socials and our website for more information on that. We also have plans for a staff corner where we can feature the amazing work of our staff, as well as much, much more. We're so excited for what comes next for Hindsight Online, and we hope you are too. With the support of our contributors, our readers, and the work of our amazing online staff, we can continue to grow. Please visit our website at hindsightjournal.org to learn more about how you can publish, you can submit to our journals, or to admire the amazing artwork and writing we're passionate about publishing. The next piece you will hear is The Promise of Granite by Mara Buck. Mara is a writer and painter who is highly awarded in the literary field. Some, but not all, of her accomplishments include the Raven Prize for Nonfiction, the Scottish Arts Club Short Story Prize, three Moon Prizes for Women's Writings, along with many more amazing feats, including work in numerous literary magazines and print anthologies. Please welcome Mara's friend, Christina Stevens, who will read The Promise of Granite, found on page 73. Good evening. The Promise of Granite by Mara Buck. A rock lies in the path, a half-buried boulder. Common main granite never destined to become an upscale kitchen countertop, merely reclining where the glacier abandoned it, satisfied with its status as a dusty, undignified mass. Something to trip you if you're careless. As long as I've walked this path, that damned rock has occupied that spot. 
Several times I've forgotten and stumbled, once even landing face first, getting personal with the woodsy world at an eye level, bruised my cheek and my ego. Damned rock. I'm not a hiker, I'm a stroller, a painter wandering the trails of my hundred rural acres, plopping down whenever the mood strikes and the light is right to capture the moment. Such moments are increasingly rare, even here behind my gate. The world intrudes. The State Highway Department appropriates more and more of my property for their wider ditches, insisting that my innocent roadside trees are a menace they must eradicate. Despite my desperate protests, they continue drenching my milkweed and ragosa with toxic weed killer that trickles into the woodland brook flowing by my house. It seeps through the soil into the planet's core to infiltrate the groundwater, kills fish and frogs, and sickens whatever drinks or feeds or breathes. Sickens me as well. This chemical has been on trial as a carcinogen banned in numerous countries, but recently our government has lifted the restrictions, considering the corporate bottom line more essential to the future of the planet than a few milkweed plants or a few cancer patients. I've tried to preserve my woods as nature intended. This place where I live is not particularly pretty. It's a mismatch of ice-downed trees and new growth, ticks and deer tracks, stately blue heron, and the occasional fox, the hole traversed by a perennially muddy driveway. Climate change and its accompanying ice storms have inflicted increased carnage on the forest. Centuries-old maples have tumbled like dominoes, their frozen tonnage crushing their relatives until the former natural growth has morphed into a war zone. The emerald ash borer and the hemlock woolly adelgid have taken their toll, but woodpeckers eat the insects before any arboreal species are totally eradicated, and the storm fatalities become apartment complexes for creatures whose rental fees replenish the woodlands. Throughout my 20 years in these woods, nature has continued to thrive, but currently nature has begun to gasp. Her plea is pitiful, and I'm helpless to intervene. I can only rant and watch. I live in a house without vinyl, freed from the trappings so adored by the real estate market of today. My hand-built house performs as a good neighbor to its site, quiet and thoughtful, and the one doesn't suffer for the other. Moss intrudes on my roof. I consider it charming. My house grows increasingly camouflaged, every day becoming more a part of the land that surrounds it. They are truly wedded, the house and the land, in a perpetual embrace. The trees maturing now outside my windows are the children of the trees whose lumber was sacrificed to become the bones of the house, and that seems just right to me. An occasional pileated woodpecker agrees as he pecks away at the posts of the porch, but this year he is alone. I'm terrified that next year I'll look for that cartoonish redhead and find nothing. Every spring I would welcome the Phoebes to their nests on my porches, one on the back, another on the front, sheltered from the weather under the roof's wide overhang, ancestral homes that are at this point as old as my own. I'd witness any number of newly hatched youngsters fledge from those porches, their fragile, tiny wings struggling until they reach the closest branch, and I would sigh in relief at their success. They made delightful tenants. But last year, the nests were empty. Historic daubs of mud and dry grass, unpretty things littered with bits of shell and feather and feces, now sad relics. I've left them in place, intact, hoping, hoping, but in my heart I know there's been a decided change. The only bird song I hear now is the hoarse cry of a lonesome crow, and I try to disregard the message. This small forest, my home, a microcosm of a larger, wilder system, has been the perfect size for a single artist to share with a secret deer herd, rabbits, foxes, squirrels, but in recent years, I cheer whenever I notice any hint of movement in the undergrowth, in the trees, along the brook. 
I saw one squirrel today, one, where there had been whole noisy families chasing each other up the maples and down the oaks. Last week, I glimpsed a solitary doe browsing beside the brook. I wanted to rush up to her to grab her and trundle her inside to cherish her. I often hear gunfire, even though my land is posted. I've never found deer remains, no evidence of slaughter, yet I fear something more deadly and insidious is the killer. The warmer climate has exploded the tick population and the animals have suffered, as have I. Each foray outside brings more ticks attached to the dog and to me, the new normal. How long can we adjust? Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring to warn of the demise of wildlife and the dangers of chemicals. Those words, Silent Spring, whisper in my ears, taunting the absence of bird song, the stilled humming of bees and dragonflies. Wild blackberry and raspberry bushes produce stunted flowers that yield no fruit. When I see a bee, which is seldom, I smile and greet her, try to encourage her to find her relatives, to enjoy the brightness of the day. The goldenrod still rises triumphant, the asters bloom still colorful in the fall, but the lupine are scraggly. The joe pie weed has disappeared entirely. The monarchs used to love the tall joe pie, gaudy orange flirting with the purple. Now they've disappeared as well. I've tried to replant milkweed, but it never blooms. There are no apples on the twisted ancient trees. The land is diminished. What was lush years ago has become sad and threadbare, an elderly comb over of its former self. The balance is tenuous. The f future is questionable. This is all so personal, so trivial, yet so unusual in the world of today that I feel I myself may be a vanishing species. My simple way of life is strangled by the cat's cradle of drooping wires that connects the vinyl houses perched along the highway to the power grid that struts across a field where deer used to graze at dawn. The residents of those vinyl-clad behemoths anxiously await the time when drones will deliver pizza directly to their fiberglass doors. I lack the money and the technology and the strength to live entirely off the grid, but my own wires are subtly buried, and only one pole at the highway announces the possibility of a 21st century human residence hidden beyond that road, beyond the driveway, beyond the trees. The rest of my property is referred to by the power company as a, quote, dead zone, end quote, along which I've forbidden poles and wires. I'm proud of my dead zone, and it gives me great pleasure that my life is framed by nature, not the crudeness of transformers. The tree canopy remains so dense around my house that Google can't find me, and I doubt any nosy drone could penetrate. Yet changes have come, and more will come, and I'm powerless to stop them. My 100 acres is wild, but certainly not wilderness. Although I can hear a low rumble of traffic from the highway, I can see no other houses. No intruding light pollution disturbs the dense black sky. The Big Dipper hangs proud over an 80-foot spruce. I used to hear night noises of foxes, owls, scurrying feet, and love songs in the dark. Now those nights are silent with only the gulping of an occasional amorous bullfrog. The chorus of peepers has vanished. I remember last summer watching a single lightning bug pulse on the window frame, only one, pulsing for a missing mate. Can an insect be lonely? Not so long ago, the evening twinkled with tiny green strobes, and I can see in memory Norman Rockwell children proudly showing off mason jars overflowing with bug light. They are happy and carefree at summer's dusk, rolling on chemical-free grass until they're called inside to supper. Their grandchildren will never know such simple pleasures. Their lights will be digital, their grass astroturf, and their suppers microwaved. Their mothers call, kids, don't drink from the hose, use your plastic bottles. Such is progress, and the lightning bugs disappear into memory. 
My knees won't allow me to hike the mountains anymore, my back too cranky to carry a pack. But my mind looks down on untamed vistas, on the wildness of the wilderness, and I vow to do whatever I can to preserve it from the chemicals, from the intrusive chainsaws and the feller bunchers and the developmental horrors cloaked in greenbacks and lies. So many lies. Now that the clean water regulations have been eroded, perhaps to force us all to drink from the plastic spring, what can we expect in the future? What will be the future when the water is too tainted for the wildlife who are critical to the balance? I dream of things that were, but I have nightmares that extend beyond my humble personal home. I think of that rock, that buried boulder in my path, and I try to consider it as metaphor, as a sign that beneath that which we can see lies the solidity of granite, bedrock that can neither be fracked away nor eroded, granite unchanged as a testament to the durability of the planet, the durability that will endure beyond this era of destruction. Thank you, Ms. Stevens, and thank you, Ms. Buck. Uh, my name is Liam Downey. This is my second semester as an editor for uh, Changing Skies Journal. Our next speaker is Mary Silwance. Uh, she's originally from Egypt, but she now lives in Kansas City. And many of her poetries and essays have already been published, but she's probably best known for her work with the ecology in an intersection of justice and spirituality. If she's not writing, you can probably find her playing charades with her three teenage daughters. Now, please turn to page 68 as she reads her piece, Sunflowers and Selfies. Divine Will. My daughters want a real Christmas tree. We have a perfectly serviceable fake tree in the basement, already decorated with colored lights, jewel-toned ornaments, shimmery with silver, Tinsel. It was a gift from a friend moving, eager to travel light, and I prefer used goods anyway. A real tree? Why? But Christmas was barreling at me fast, so I caved and went to a nearby nursery. I found one that was just right. Well, just right in a Charlie Brown Christmas sort of way, small and spindly. It shivered in the corner with another scrawny scrap of a fur, reminding me of the leftover kids who never got picked for kickball. I took home the discounted, desiccated tree to decorate. When my girls were small, we cut holiday cards into a long chain. This colorful homemade garland paired with tiny white lights adorned the gangly fur perfectly. I then sat in the darkened living room, enjoying the Charlie Brown vibe, a soft glow gracing the room. But I was uneasy. Ecosystems were exterminated to plant acres of fir, spruce, and pine. What synthetic inputs forced them to grow into marketable shapes and sizes? How far did they have to travel to get to a store near me? What kept them fresh? Were they shipped in refrigerated trucks like fruit and vegetables? That seems ecologically excessive, when we've been averaging 50-degree weather this December in Missouri. Besides, what will I do with the tree after Christmas? If it's loaded with chemicals, I don't want to compost it or toss it in the backyard for critters to nibble on. I don't want it decomposing near my garden beds, nor do I want to landfill organic matter. And then I remembered... To secure the tree, I bored screws into four sides of it, shredding bark, tree skin, in the process. Trees feel. They form families, create diverse communities, take care of each other. I imagined rows upon rows of firs, just like this one, and monocrop plantations across the country. Indentured. Trees bred to be consumed then discarded. 
Even my environmental concerns about a live tree regarded the tree as an it, as an object. I feel a disconnect. The Christmas ritual I had just participated in doesn't match my growing awareness of the sentience of all beings. Doesn't match my growing awareness of the sacredness of all beings. I think of the common Christian refrain, Christmas refrain, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. While this excludes certain people, it certainly discounts non-humans. Whatever falls outside of men can be othered, dominated, abused, used, enslaved, marginalized, even killed for the glory of the Most High. Progeny of this God, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have littered history with those deemed undeserving of goodwill. The legacy continues as goodwill is still not extended to all beings, let alone all humans. But because sacredness pulses and shimmers in every speck of earth, all beings are deserving of goodwill. This startles me. If sacredness is the fabric of everything, why don't our Christmas traditions reflect that? Why participate in rituals that subjugate other beings? What's more, these traditions, the tree, lights, decorations, excess, grand religious services, rely on extractive practices that don't foster goodwill or peace on earth, but jeopardize the lives of countless beings, human and non, to provide material accoutrement for the holiday season. How does that honor the divine? To be complicit in the desecration of earth and her beings, to deny the sacred and its wondrous omnipresence means we have become severed from understanding ourselves as sacred. We deny our own holiness. Otherwise, how can we be callous to the sacredness of the other? As I journey toward my inner divine, I understand divinity as the fabric we are each knit from, which means we ourselves and all we encounter are holy beings deserving of reverence. The anemic fur in my living room bolted to a tree stand is propped up on a yellow plastic milk crate hidden under a snowman tree skirt to give her height. It's time for new rituals. Let's develop traditions to honor the sacred within and in every being so we can authentically manifest goodwill toward each being. Indeed, divine will. Then we'd have a chance at peace on and with earth. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Campbell, and I focus on managing the editorial and acquisitions processes for Changing Skies and Hindsight. Um, this will be my last semester with the journal, so I just wanted to emphasize how awesome of an opportunity this has been for both myself and all of my peers. Um, if you've ever thought to yourself, like, wow, I really wish I could be rewarded for my writing skills and my creative abilities, I would really, really recommend getting involved with our staff. Um, anybody who's a CU student can earn up to one to three credit hours for like this real class by registering for our class code writing3090 or reaching out to work on an internship and to contribute on their own time. Um, you can work on staff also contributing towards the writing certificate or the public writing minor at CU. But long story short, we really just find a way for anybody who wants to get involved to contribute meaningfully, whether that's in class or remotely or however they want. So please reach out and we will include you. Um, you won't regret it. Our next reader, uh, Marcus Tan Lowe, is a widely published ecological ethicist and animal, animal rights activist hailing from Australia. Please enjoy his recounting of When Humans Swarmed on page 91. Hello everybody. Hope you're doing well in Denver, Colorado and around the world if you're watching me wherever you are. My name is Marcus Ten Lowe and I was recently published in the latest issue of Changing Skies. This is my version of the previous issue in which I was published. 
um, but I'm really keen to see the new edition uh, possibly online. So I'm a vegan and anti-natalist living in Brisbane, Australia, and my poem for Changing Skies is called When Humans Swarmed. When humans swarmed the earth, breathing down each other's necks, titillated, shaped as zooming crowns. Our natures were bitter, some sweet, some replete with more and more children, churned out like blobs from factories. Set up with de desks and chairs and a million brilliant material items, sat up with a babyfied bewilderment of stairs. As we watched the green-washed oceans, eyed by their blackish dead zones, with poisoned fishes darting furtively. Babies' needs and wants, chimey songs, flowed in us into happy illusions, celebrated further in creamy advertising. Despite such smiles and little sighs, with sea life thrashing in nets, pulled from the wasting oceans, the oceans slowly rise. Widespread obesity resizing, we relearned it as beautiful, just as franken chickens assumed their own neat sacrifice. It was our grace to say something nice. Dr. Doolittle came over. We had a ball trusting that plenty more animals, non-human, were left in tracts of forest or ice. The glaciers, dripping in sunlight, had shear and shred, leaving so many gazers dead. We really should do something now, we know, but eight billion living on the globe cannot be unlearnt. The earth has not long to go. Thank you for listening to my poem and I will see you next time, hopefully. Have a lovely party and bless you all. Bye. Hi, I'm Isabel Pitalue, and I'm the marketing director for Hindsight and Changing Skies. I'm Annalise Burgess, and I am the social media director for Hindsight and Changing Skies. I'm a junior, and I am majoring in journalism and minoring in writing and public engagement. Yeah, this semester our team has the pleasure of sending weekly newsletters, running social media campaigns, encouraging submissions from around the world, and keeping in contact with the program for writing and rhetoric and our peers at CU. So this year, Hindsight decided to dedicate a role specifically to social media, which I have been proud to step into, and I feel so grateful for that opportunity. Um, I am also on the marketing team, and I work closely with Isabel, and I also help out with editorial and art direction. Um, I can honestly say that joining Hindsight has been one of the best experiences I've had at CU so far. I would recommend it to anyone. And I just wanted to take a minute to thank the staff and Jay for welcoming me into the family from day one. For, con for continuing support, updates, and announcements, follow us on Instagram at hindsight.journal and sign up for our newsletter on our website, hindsightjournal.org. Now please give us a warm welcome for James Mead, an undergraduate student at CU studying English literature, and he is going to read his poem, Six More Weeks of Winter, on page 49. Hi, I'm James. Demeter was deep downtrodden when April winds were dry. Hades held her daughter still, unable yet to fly. Waterfowl, scrupulous, returned on tight timetables to find the earth still frozen hard, not a morsel to be taken. Weeping willow wept still louder to find her boughs still barren, and all the people shook their heads except the crude oil baron. Surrounded by bright poppies now, that non-eternal winter, and being found just wrong for now, my hands are hardly shaking. Mother holds her daughter scared, new gleam in Hades' eye. In his mind, a new deal making, six then six revised.
Thank you, James. And thank you to everybody who came out tonight. Uh, we really appreciate having you guys out here for our launch event. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to do these every year and now every semester uh, with our second print title. So thanks again. Uh, big round of applause to James and all the readers for coming out tonight. Thank you all. That is all we have for you this evening. We're going to be here till about 8.30, so feel free to hang out and mingle. Uh, if you have any questions about anything at all, submitting work, uh, following us for more information about journals, joining staff, if you're a student, track one of us down. We love to talk. So, uh, so definitely come, come grab us. There's a few more bites of food out there. Feel free to grab some of that, too. And, uh, and follow us on our socials. Again, thanks, thank you to uh, Isabel and Annalise for, for uh, shouting out our socials. Thank you to all of our staff speakers doing a great job putting on this event. Thank you to Simon uh, hosting, our, hosting our videos in the, in the corner there, very impromptu. Uh, so quick round of applause for, for all our staff members doing a great job tonight. And uh, yeah, I won't, I won't hold you in your chairs any longer. Have a good night, guys. Drive safe.